Hi, this is Gary Auden. Welcome to this Educast, Death of a Conference Call, sponsored by Revo Labs and Telecom Reseller. Today, I'll be speaking as moderator, and I'll have Jonathan McCary, who's field systems engineer with Revo Labs, who has a lot of actual hands-on experience with a lot of this technology, and that's why we're going to focus on a lot of the problems of creating a good conference call. So what we're going to talk about are things like room acoustics, how can the network impact the quality of the calls? You probably will have some bridging technology thrown into the connection somewhere. Does it help or hurt? And what happens if it hurts you? What can you do to deal with the problems? You may own the problem. In other words, it may be on your endpoints. It could be the network. What can you solve as problems that you can control? And what are the things that you cannot control? And I'd like to start off, Jonathan, with this first slide of yours, which I think is really good. What makes conference calls fail? Sure. So a lot of uh, uh, factors are, are in place here. I think the biggest one is uh, what actually the room acoustics are in the near and far end. Um, you know, a lot of times people will uh, build rooms that aren't acoustically uh, sound but architecturally it may be uh, beautiful, a lot of glass walls, a lot of reflective surfaces, that kind of thing, which can really affect the audio quality coming uh, from the room to the far end. Um, other things such as you know, bridging services, uh, you know, what platforms you're using can certainly limit um, how, the quality of a call. You know, an analog phone line is only going to have 3.5K of um, audio bandwidth. Um, you know, certainly, and probably the most uh, unspoken one is, is the meeting attendee etiquette. You know, people that are having side conversations, not speaking loud enough um, and clearly, uh, you know, things like that, uh, even, you know, rustling papers, tapping pens, uh, those kind of things can be really distracting uh, to the far end and really derail a call pretty quickly. I thought it was interesting on the right-hand side of this page here where you demonstrate just how much lost time there is for a lot of these conference calls. Absolutely. And, you know, any time that, um, you know, the technology can get in the way of productivity, you know, that can start a snowball effect where you start really avoiding the technology altogether. And I think that that's where, um, you know, my personal philosophy is that the technology should be invisible, uh, that it should just work uh, and allow you to be productive and so that it doesn't create this psychological noise for you as an end user going into the room that you're you know, on top of being worried about having a productive meeting and getting through all the things that you need to do to do your job, but also having that psychological noise of is the, you know, is the, is the call going to go well? Is the, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of problems? There just is a lot of anxiety around technology that I think if you design rooms uh, correctly uh, can really be alleviated quite a bit. But the point you know, you're making about the rooms is also limited in that we've got five components here that can give us problems, not just simply the room itself. Sure, and, and that's where a lot of you know, points of failure can, can occur. Um, you, know, you have the near end, which is the room that you're in, uh, and what we call the far end, where you know, the people in the other rooms uh, are. And that can be one uh, room as a far end or many. Um, and so there's a lot of different variables uh, when it comes to that. And so when we talk about uh, you know, how these are, are going off, there are some assumptions that we're going to uh, make here where, you know, we do uh, assume that there is broadband internet, um, you know, that an avoid network, there is, uh, uh, everything's configured correctly on that network, that the phones are registered to the IP PBX, and that everything's plugged in, etc. So, you know, based off of those assumptions, even when those things are all right, um, there are certainly other points of failure that can really um, hurt, the, hurt, hurt the user experience. Let's start off the conversation in more detail and start with the near end, what the problems are there. Sure. So a lot of them are you know, making sure that you're matching this conference system uh, in the room that you're in uh, with what you're trying to do. So for example, you know, I see a lot of times where people will use a conference phone for a table of 24 people and then complain that they can't be heard on the far end. Well, the reason they can't be heard is that they're just using the wrong tool for the job. And that really size room needs to have a little bit more sophisticated integration so that you can properly uh, mic uh, everybody uh, so that they can be heard clearly and consistently on the far end. Um, 
you know, certainly ambient noise is a big uh, issue as well. So whenever I go on for a site visit, usually the first thing I do is to tell everybody to be quiet so that I can listen to the room and what it sounds like when no one's talking. So is there street noise? Is there HVAC? You know, this is a great time of year to do it when it's you're having these 94 degree days and the, uh, uh, the air conditioning system is really ramped up to try and keep the rooms cool. This can co introduce a lot of noise uh, into a call if you're uh, you know, using some uh, you know, technology that's not going to be able to cancel that out. And the third thing here is really pervasive, um, and it's not going away, are the use of glass walls uh, in, in conference rooms. And so while glass walls look great, and I understand the, um, the need for transparency, um, they, from an acoustic standpoint, they can really get in the way uh, and create this what we call a fishbowl effect. So a lot of times people will call uh, you know, me and say, hey, it sounds like you know, we're in a fishbowl and there's a lot of reverberance in the room and I say, well, you know, tell me about the room that we're, you're in and they'll tell me three walls of floor to ceiling glass and I'll say, well, you are in a fishbowl. Um, and there's ways to get around this and to acoustically treat uh, the rooms or even use some uh, more aggressive um, echo cancellation techniques, but, you know, at the end of the day, these glass walls and this uh, open transparent uh, culture, if you will, at, at the enterprise isn't going away, and so we need to find ways to, to help mitigate that and, and, and work around it. Now, you've talked about the glass walls, and I think this picture helps bring up some points you haven't even mentioned yet. Could you discuss yeah. those? Sure, yeah. So this is a room uh, at a customer up in Canada that I was in where, as you can see here, there's three uh, glass walls, and if you notice, they're actually curved as well, which even uh, adds to the reflectivity of the room. And then on the fourth wall there, you have two large uh, flat panel displays. So there's just a lot of hard surfaces here where your, your voice is going to bounce off of. And, um, you know, the, the initial, I suppose, look that you'd want to maybe go for in this room is just slap, you know, either a conference phone in the middle of that table or even just maybe one omnidirectional uh, microphone. But the, the fact is, is that that room is so reflective uh, that you need to use some different miking techniques to make it work. So if you see here on the table, there's four of our wireless elite microphones that are directional. So they have a very focused pickup pattern that's just going to kind of create this small bubble in front of it for the users there. And then they reject any reflections back uh, coming on the backside. So, um, you know, this certainly was a room that had a lot of acoustic challenges that you we had to work around, but to, to get to work. The other thing that you can't, uh, you know, perhaps see in this photo, but the HVAC in this room was very, very loud. Um, and so that was another thing that was adding to, you know, not only did you have reflections, you also had uh, HVAC uh, blowing in the background and creating a lot of noise. So that's also why we wanted to use a, a directional microphone to kind of control that uh, and, and not be able to pick that up as much as uh, an omnidirectional microphone would. Uh, and then the fourth thing, or the third thing here is, uh, you can't see it, but to the right, there's, we're at uh, one floor uh, above street level, and there are, you know, fire trucks that go by, there's just regular day-to-day -day street noise in a, in a city, major city in Canada, that uh, we also want to be able to, to not pick up and not be ag aggressively introducing to the far end of the call. So this is, uh, you know, the reason I took the photo when I was here is this is one of those rooms that was a real challenge to get right, and we did, but this uh, has a lot of the fundamental things that we're seeing in this space that uh, can really make a, a conferencing experience um, pretty bad if you don't address these issues up front. I would imagine sometimes you run into decorators that have a different idea of what a room should look like. So let's talk about arranging the room for the audio. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, how are you uh, setting up your tables uh, really does um, affect how you can uh, mic people. Uh, and sometimes these are all different uh, settings in one room. So what we call, you know, these uh, rooms with modular furniture where tables can be set up in a, you know, circle, a square. They can be a U-shape, a boardroom, classroom, whatever it is. You need to be able to adequately mic those uh, rooms. That's typically where our wireless microphones come into play. Um, but also having network access uh, so that you can, you know, actual cabling uh, to get to the uh, to get to the the internet. Um, you know whether people are on a chair or a couch, uh, you know, you really, you know, you want to make sure that you're filling the audio, uh, or not only sending the audio to the far end, but also bringing the far end into the room, um, where you may have a large room where people are only going to be joining as participants. They're just listening to the far end. You know, if you have 60 people in a room and you're trying to just use a conference phone for that, 
it's never going to be loud enough. You need to have a room that has integrated speakers, um, you know, where they can actually uh, comfortably uh, and intelligibly listen to uh, what's being said. And then also the big thing for it is to have a you know a, a user interface that's uh, intuitive, simple, uh, and allows people to you know, to 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 use the room uh, without having to call somebody from IT to help you know come come and set it up. Would you provide us some criteria for selecting, evaluating the right technologies? Sure. Uh, you know everything certainly needs to have noise reduction. What we mean by noise reduction is uh, when we were talking before about ambient noise. So that you know what's happening in the room when no one's talking, and a way to eliminate that from the far end, where the technology basically says, "I know that that's just HVAC, or um, you know, it's not important audio, and can and can cancel it out." Um, acoustic treatments are really big for uh, excessive reverberation, um, echo cancellation, uh, and automatic gain control. So not everybody, what the gain, automatic gain control is, is it, it, uh, a, a processor will adjust how sensitive a mic is based on what the sound pressure level applied to it is. And so, you, you know, at the end of the day, not everybody are clear, loud speakers that project. Um, you do have quiet. Uh, speakers, uh, and so this can kind of allow some flexibility with still maintaining a good uh, a volume to the far end based off of who is uh, speaking. We have the next, the next slide, which is best practices, and you have nine of them here. What are the three you think are most important? So I think the, the, the first one on this list, the near and far end, enjoy the consistent high quality audio signal transmission with no dropouts. That is ultimately what we need, uh, you know, consistent, uh, intelligible audio, where you're not asking people to repeat things because you've dropped out, etc. cetera. Um, I think the second biggest one is the, you know, the easy process for uh, initiating, pausing, you know, just in, in being able to uh, make it easy for people to use. Uh, and that goes back to that you know, anxiety that people can have uh, over technology. So the easier uh, you make it to use, uh, the more likely people are going to use it and not waste time, uh, in which in time is money, um, you know, starting and, and completing their meetings. And the last one is, you know, the interference from background noises, echoes, etc. So uh, keeping these uh, rooms um, so that they're treated right, uh, microphoned correctly, um, so that, you know, the, the ultimate experience um, is a positive one uh, to the far end. Now, one of the points that I think you're going to make next is the conference bridge, which is usually taken for granted, can actually be an impediment to this operation. Yeah, it can be. Uh, this is something that I've run into a couple, only a handful of times uh, out in the field, but um, it, it, it can uh, exist. And really, you know, to break it down, I had a customer who was using our microphones in a conference room, and if they dialed to somebody's desk, uh, it sounded great. If they dialed to somebody's cell phone, it sounded great. If they dialed to one bridging service, it sounded great. If they uh, dialed to another one that they used, uh, it was the audio quality was very poor. It was very quiet, um, and so we were brought in to to investigate uh, on that. And what it ended up being was, you know, we looked at all, you know, four of these calls, and only one of them. Was, was really poor, so we said, hmm, let's actually get a hold of the bridging provider and see what's going on. Uh, and sure enough, we did, and the bridging provider said, oh, yeah, we actually throttled down um, those calls to a, to a, you know, to save bandwidth on their end. The customer demanded that they uh, open that back up. They did, and all their, you know, that bridging service sounded just as good as the other style of calls that they had. So uh, it was not something that I was aware of that even bridging services do, but if you do run into a, a case where, you know, certain bridging services aren't sounding the same as a point-to-point -point call or a cell phone call, um, that's one route you can go. And usually it, the two times that I've run into it, the, the, the bridging service uh, uh, quickly fixed it. Now, could we have the same kinds of problems if we had a hosted IPPBX service? Yeah, I think you know. At the end of the day, um, the you know the, the the convenience of a hosted service certainly makes sense for a lot of small, medium-sized businesses. It's something that's becoming more pervasive uh, every day. Um, you are relying on somebody else's service and technology, so that can be uh, uh, somewhat of a of a problem at times. Um, just getting answers and, and really diagnosing problems where you're, you're ultimately relying on somebody else's service. So. You know, the, the solution to those and just, you know, kind of best practices with that is always make sure that there's a good service level agreement in place 
that you get uh, quick resolutions to uh, your tickets when you open them, and get you know analytics back from your provider when they do solve uh, a problem, and, and, and really make sure that you train yourself on how to understand those numbers and how to understand those analytics so that uh, you can have a better um, idea of what's going on. You know, the, the, the more that you learn about how uh, these problems uh, and what their symptoms are, you know, can perhaps also help you diagnose the problems uh, to your uh, provider in a, in a quicker manner, right? You're not going back trying to figure out, you know, you can say, hey, I, th I think this is what's going on. Can you check it out? Um, but I think those are always, uh, you know, uh, a, a quick way, a quicker way to, to resolve issues as they come up. Would you say that when we talk about the far end, it actually has a similar set of problems that the near end side could have? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the first thing is, to, you know, the reproduction of the sound matters, right? Uh, I had a, a, a client once, uh, we had a global call for a company that I worked for, CEO was doing his annual address, and one person out of a company of 10,000 plus complained about the audio quality, and it turned out that he was listening to the call on his cell phone in his convertible driving down the road. There's not much I can do about that, right? So, you know, make sure that you're using uh, uh, you know, an interface uh, on the far end that uh, that makes sense. You know, we don't use a boombox at the end of a movie theater. You have theater sounds so that everybody can have a very full, immersive experience. And so these conference rooms are the same way. And so, you know, put it in your invite to, you know, remind people to use proper equipment. Um, you know, book the best room for it. Again, I kind of make that analogy of, you know, don't book a room that's you're going to cram you know, 30 or 40 people into and only have a, a conference phone as uh, your means of listening. That's just not going to work. You're not going to have people uh, in the back of the room be able to hear it. Um, and if people aren't going to hear it, they're going to tune out, they're going to start having side conversations, and then they're not paying attention. And that's really what eats at productivity. And also a big thing, too, is to make, you know, uh, uh, conference calls, if it's just a, a one-way delivery of information, like a, you know, a CEO's annual address or whatever, uh, make it a listen-only. Uh, most bridging services allow you to do that um, so that you don't have people that have dogs barking in the background or the person who you know, puts the call on hold and you have to listen to the hold music and things that are, you know, we've all been on calls that do that. Um, and these are just simple things that you can plan ahead of time to make sure that you, you, you do to make sure that your call goes well. Revo Labs is a company in this business. Would you give us a little bit of background? Sure. Um, so uh, we started in uh, 2005. We are headquartered in Sudbury, Massachusetts, which is right outside of Boston. Uh, as of 2014, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of the Yamaha Corporation. Um, and what we do is really focus on audio solutions to provide you know, natural and effective communication uh, for every meeting environment, whether that's a large uh, lecture hall, a uh, big boardroom, or small huddle room, and everything in between. We have audio interfaces that um, you know, can fit into any one of those spaces. And we feel that uh, you know, audio is the most effective way of communication. When paired with video, it's even better. Um, but really, you know, uh, audio is really you know, the fundamental way in which we all communicate with each other. You have several products. Would you spend a moment on those? Sure. Um, so right now I'm actually talking to you, Gary, on a UC500, which is a USB type uh, device that uh, plugs into a PC. Uh, they're really great for medium or small huddle room office uh, type spaces. Uh, our UC platform is really taking off. It's doing very well in the uh, huddle space. Um, UC 1000 and 1500 uh, use that USB um, functionality, but also uh, combine it with a SIP phone. So it can be a conference phone. You can also use it as a USB device, and you can combine those two uh, together. So when you, uh, our YVC 1000 is a Yamaha uh, product. Um, that is similar for uh, you know using for USB type um, uh, applications, and then our executive elite microphones are our wireless microphones that go into your multi-purpose rooms, your big board rooms, auditoriums, that that type of space. Thank and you very really much, jo Jonathan. I think we're, we've had a really good education on what to think about. What I'd like to point out to people here: there are two ways of getting a hold of Revo Labs through their sales and through their website. And to point out, they have a really good article that helps amplify what Jonathan was talking about called Why Sound Matters. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Gary.